Okay, so for this audio lecture, we're looking at the adaptive response, um, so the nonspecific response, um, and looking at the lymphocytes that play a role in this response. So, um, looking, remembering back to chapter um, 14, with chapter 15, the focus is on that uh, um, third line of defense, um, keeping in mind that. Um, we can further break down that for third line of defense into natural acquired and artificial acquired. So natural acquired would be um, immunity that we get because we are exposed to the pathogen. Um, and this can either be active because we had the infection. So with active, our immune system is doing the work. With passive, this is where like maternal antibodies get passed um, through the placenta um, or in breast milk, um, and so someone else's immune system, mom, um, has produced the antibodies, but then baby benefits from it. So again, natural acquired can either be active or passive. With artificial acquired, um, I always kind of joke, this is where a copay is needed. Um, so this is where um, medicine is being utilized, um, so healthcare professionals. Uh, it still can be active because it can be our immune system that's doing the work. So vaccines, um, traditionally um, with vaccines, our immune system, after we've been immunized, um, has a response to what we're immunized against. Um, and the idea is that what we're immunized against or with is close enough to what we would naturally come across that we end up getting protection through that vaccination. We can have passive um, artificial immunity. Um, this is where we might receive um, blood transfusion or um, serum from somebody who has recovered. Um, so definitely in the news, convalescent plasma um, from patients who have recovered from COVID has been in the news for a potential treatment um, because those people who have um, survived COVID would potentially have antibodies against it. And if we were to take their blood or their um, serum, their plasma, we could then give those antibodies to someone and they would help um, fight because you wouldn't have to wait for the patient who has the active infection to generate their own antibodies. Okay. Um, kind of before COVID, um, 2015, we had Ebola virus. Um, so individuals who had survived Ebola virus um, were able to do blood transfusions um, for patients with it, as long as you were blood match. Um, prior to that, um, an example of passive artificial would be if you accidentally got like a needle stick and there was a potential of HIV exposure, you were given massive amounts of antibodies, um, immunoglobulins, um, and they weren't to HIV specifically, but the idea was by just giving you all these antibodies, it would just kind of blog, <laughs> hopefully bind the, um, the virus and block its ability to enter and replicate. <clears throat> okay. So um, we will look at the aspects that play into um, natural and artificial uh, immunity. And that would be your... B cells and T cells. Your B cells are going to produce antibodies, but both T cells and B cells also produce a number of cytokines, and there's accessory cells like antigen-presenting cells that play critical roles too. <clears throat> so when we look at the third and final line, of final line of defense, you know this is it. This is all you've got. If the innate system wasn't able to handle the pathogen, you have to have the, you know, hopefully your B cell and T cell response would be sufficient to clear any kind of infection. And again, this is um, occurs either whether we're talking about an infection or a vaccination. <clears throat> when we're talking about immunocompensy, um, this is the ability for the body to react to foreign substance. And again, through this process, we end up developing T cells and B cells. And that these lymphocytes would be specific to a specific antigen. And with that, the term antigen just refers to something that the immune system can recognize. Um, a lot of times, um, those are proteins, um, and the proteins are broken down, and then we have peptides, and then specific pieces of those peptides your T cell or B cell would recognize using its receptor. Um, but again, antigen is just a general term um, 
we know that nucleic acid and even certain carbohydrates and lipids can act as antigens. But again, what's been studied um, the most, because it um, just because of the techniques we have, are protein antigens. There are two important characteristics with the third line of defense that really distinguish it between our other line of defenses. It's that specificity, um, so that it's recognizing specific. It's not just is it me or is it not. So with innate, it's that non-self versus self. Um, with adaptive, it is specific. It can tell the difference between um, hemorrhagic E. coli versus beneficial E. coli. Um, different salmonellas, you know, it, it distinguishes. It's, it's specific to a um, bagella protein um, versus some other aspect, right? So very specific and again, within that antigen um, specific sequences that are present. And then there's also a memory component so that once um, you've been exposed to something, you have memory against it so that the response afterwards would be um, quicker and stronger. So um, always a kind of pool of B cells and T cells are saved for memory. And we'll look at that a little bit. So really one of the important aspects of this is the development of these T cells and B cells, so development of the lymphocytes. Um, so this kind of outlines the basic um, stages of their development. Um, so we're going to have the initial development and differentiation of the lymphocytes um, into T cells and B cells, and then they get presented antigen. Um, and these antigen, this first antigen challenge is actually self-protein, self-antigens. And we want to make sure that those um, T cells and B cells don't recognize self. So it's actually, you, you want, it's a negative selection. You don't want the T cells and B cells to respond because you don't want T cells and B cells that recognize self. Then what happens is the third stage, we have a challenge with actual antigen, foreign material. Um, so this is where antigen presenting cells will present antigen to it antigen from a foreign material or from a dead, dying, damaged cell, altered self. And then at that point, the <clears throat> T cell or B cell would respond to it if it can recognize it. And then we move into the fourth stage where we have products being formed. Um, so whether that's our antibody or whether that's the cell-mediated immunity that T cells give us. Um, so for cell-mediated immunity, this is where the T cells will respond, and whether that's producing cytokines, whether that's moving to the location where the pathogen's located and killing the pathogen, or whether it's um, providing help to um, other cells like the B cells. So this um, figure from the textbook kind of gives you a better visual of these different stages. So again, the first stage we have to take our stem cell, our hermatopoietic stem cell, and then our lymphoid progenitor, and we have to differentiate those into T cells and B cells. So for T cells, they're gonna um, develop in the thymus. So not the thyroid, but the thymus. Um, so a lot of times students, they get the T and the T, but they're like, ah. Oh. Um, so it's in your thymus that T cells will actually differ, um, um, develop mature. And then they'll move into secondary lymphatic organs like the lymph node and the spleen. For B cells, they um, mature, develop in the bone marrow, so B, B. Um, they're actually named for a structure that's found in bird, not actually bone marrow. It just works out that they um, are found in the bone marrow during development. Um, once they've undergone selection, then they are going to move to the lymph node and spleen. Okay, so this first stage is antigen independent. Um, so again, there's a selection for making sure that you don't recognize self, um, but your foreign material actually isn't present. Um, so it's not that we're looking for a positive response, we're just looking for a negative response in that um, looking at the in the bone marrow and in the thymus, all the different um, proteins um, that are produced that you don't respond to any of those. If you do, um, if you do respond to self, then um, you would be eliminated. Um, you would go into apoptosis. So then we have um, our antigen-dependent response. Um, so this is where they would be presented with antigen. 
here we see our um, cell that has all the like looks like an octopus with all its dendrites um, so all its little projections and on there are going to be MHC markers or MHC receptors so these receptors can hold antigen um, so it can take up pathogen um, so this would be a phagocyte so it can take up the pathogen it can break it down into small little pieces and then put and load antigen onto the MHC so you can see here on the right of that top panel how on those receptors we have antigen um, present there and it can present it to the T cell which through its T cell receptor it, it can potentially see that antigen. Now it may not see the antigen, in that case nothing happens, um, but if it does see its antigen it becomes activated. So you can see how it will make copies of itself and some of those cells will become memory cells. Um, it could be a helper cell, so that's where that helper cell can help the B cell, so it can actually um, help stimulate that B cell so the B cell can become activated. We can also have T regulatory cells and um, cytotoxic T cells. So in that lower right panel, you can see all those different types of T cells that play into cell mediated immunity. Looking back at our B cell, um, it can interact with that antigen presenting cell, that dendritic cell, um, which again could be any kind of phagocyte. So it could be a macrophage, it could be a neutrophil. Um, it can interact with the MHCs on that, on that um, cell and if the antigen is recognized by the B cell receptor, it can become activated. Again, T helper cells can help with this so that um, the B cell becomes activated, um, quote unquote, better, has a stronger response. Um, some of those B cells will become memory B cells. Other ones will become plasma cells. Plasma cells are just activated mature B cells that secrete antibody. So some B cells keep antibodies bound to their membranes and other B cells will secrete the antibodies so that the antibodies can move into the blood and into surrounding tissues so that they can kind of search for the pathogen. So maybe they can activate complement. Um, and this plays into humoral immunity, humoral meaning fluid, because antibodies are found in the fluids in our body and it allows the immune system to be everywhere. So again, um, I, this figure, um, these pat this slide and the previous slide, really important, complex. Um, so we'll definitely walk through it during class with some annotation so it becomes a little bit easier to see. Um, definitely something that is nicely whiteboarded. <laughs> um, so with our lymphocytes, um, you should know what's the role of antigen presenting cells, APCs. It's right in the name. It's to present antigen, right? So these are phagocytes that have undergone engulfment of pathogens, digested them, and now they're going to present them on their MHC um, molecules, on their surface markers, surface receptors, to other immune cells. Um, when the T cells and B cells are making copies of themselves, that's what we would call a clone. Um, so it's like a, you know, photocopy, a Xerox, it's They've got the same genetic information, but then they differentiate and have maybe different function. And then you should know what humoral immunity is. Again, it's the antibodies present in the fluid in our body. So just looking at these MHCs, um, again, these are the receptors that tell our cells whether these other cells are us or not. So all your cells in your body, except for your red blood cells, would have some form of MHC um, markers, receptors on their surface. So MHC class one, which you can see on this figure, has one transmembrane domain. <clears throat> it um, is found on all nucleated um, human cells. So again, red blood cells eject their nucleus, so they're not able to actually produce MHCs. Um, they do this after they produce all the hemoglobin. And so again, they've lost the ability to produce MHCs. And so they would be the only cells in your body that don't have MHCs. So your lung cells, your skin cells, your liver cells, um, muscle cells, all these cells would have MHC class 1. And this allows them to present internal um, antigens. So if they're virally infected, <clears throat> they can take viral proteins, put them on the MHC class 1 
so that it can be shown to other immune cells. The other immune cells would know because it's, an, it's the correct MHC class one that this is them, you know, but there's something wrong, right? There's the antigen being presented, so maybe we're virally infected. Also with things like interferon production too, that would indicate Okay, so it allows again communication to from non-immune cells to immune cells. Now your immune cells would also have MHC class one because they can become virally infected. They need to talk to other immune cells about what's going on in them. <clears throat> but from um, looking at our immune cells, what's unique about them is that they also have MHC class two. So you can see with MHC class two, it has two transmembrane domains. So I just remember class one. One has one, and class two has two. Um, so you should be able to, you know, if I had this figure on the exam, you should be able to identify, or figure like this, you should be able to identify which one is MHC class one versus class two. Again, MHC class two is found on all of your immune cells, so all your leukocytes would have them, and it's the way that they present antigens. So phagocytes, after they undergo phagocytosis, it's MHC class two that they are going to load um, the antigen, those um, digested pieces onto, so that they can interact with the other receptors on other cells. So looking at some of the properties of B cells and T cells, if we were to compare and contrast them, you should definitely know the site of maturation of development being the bone marrow for B cells and the thymus for T cells. When we look at their surface markers, B cells have B cell receptors, which um, <clears throat> which are immunoglobins, um, and then T cells have T cell receptors. And this is where um, the, the table says that T cells have several CD mo um, molecules, but B cells also have CD molecules, so I don't know if I'd use this as a compare and contrast. <laughs> um, so this is where um, probably future editions hopefully will correct this. Um, if I was reviewing this chapter, I'd be like, ah, no. Um, um, so both B cells and T cells have surface markers, or CDs um, that are unique to them that can be used to identify which one they have. Um, for B cells, they circulate in blood at low numbers, whereas T cells are at higher numbers. Um, <clears throat> still not really high numbers. <laughs> um, so if you were to try to isolate T cells um, from the blood, um, you, you wouldn't get a lot of them <laughs> because your blood's mostly red blood cells. Um, you could definitely use it as an indicator, so you could do a blood smear, and you could definitely use it as an indicator. Um, but if you're looking to isolate T cells <clears throat> um, in doing in vivo um, studies, you're more likely to um, look at lymph nodes. Um, but obviously lymph node sampling from, from people aren't as easy. Now for B cells, what what's in blood that would indicate um, what's happening to B cells is antibodies. Um, so taking blood, plasma, um, and then looking for antibody production or changes in antibodies um, indicates what's happening to the B cells. So that's um, done quite commonly. Uh, the receptors that are used um, to sense the antigen would be the B cell receptor and then the T cell receptor. And then if we were to look in lymphatic organs, we would find the B cells in a structure called the cortex, um, where the T cells are going to be um, interior to the follicles, so the pericortexal sites, okay? Um, with looking at whether um, antigens required to be presented on MHC, for T cells, they have to be presented in MHCs. B cells do not. Um, so, and again, keep in mind that um, B cells can also undergo um, phagocytosis, not really well, um, not as, as well as some of the other phagocytes, but they can undergo phagocytosis, okay? When um, they see antigen, so antigen stim stimulation, um, B cells will become plasma cells and we also will have memory cells. For T cells, there's, um, as we saw, there's several different types of T cells, our helper cells, our cytotoxic cells, and regulatory, and then we also have memory. And looking at the general function of the B cell, it's to produce antibodies, and the antibodies will inactivate, neutralize, or target antigen. For T cells, it's to help other immune cells, suppress the immune response, 
or kill abnormal cells, and they can also lead to hypersensitivity, um, and they're able to produce, synthesize and produce um, secrete cytokines. Okay, so we already kind of touched upon this, so this is just looking at like another figure, another representation of um, lymphocyte development. Um, so again, for T cells, um, their development happens in the thymus and the B cells happen in the bone marrow. All lymphocytes start at the bone marrow though, um, because that is where the hematopoietic stem cell um, is present. Um, and there's a term called naive, that means it's immature, so it hasn't seen its antigen yet. And we talked about the idea of clone. Um, so again, what we're going to do is make copies, so we don't have to start off from, start from the beginning. So once we see antigen, um, we can see in that bottom panel, um, that red cell has seen its antigen, so it's going to make copies or clones of itself. So again, that we don't have to go all the way back to the hematopoietic stem cell or to our lymphoid um, progenitor in order to produce this T cell or B cell again. Um, we can just make copies of it because we know the receptor combination is quote-unquote good because it's seen its antigen. Okay, so next we're going to look at... Um, Antigen, so I've already kind of talked about what antigens are, but we'll just look at some of the different, um, you know, molecules that can act as antigens and a little bit more about them. And then we'll also look at antibodies. So when we're looking at antigens, um, antigens can come from different sources. So we can have them coming from microbial cells or viruses, but we can also have foreign um, human or animal cells. Um, and so, you know, if we have a mismatch of blood, or we have a transplant out of an organ, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get a close, <clears throat> a close match as possible, but if it's not done correctly, um, there could be differences between those cells and our, our normal cells. So again, that would be considered kind of foreign material, but also certain plant molecules um, can also cause responses. And so the idea is, um, you know, it has, the molecule has to be large enough that it gets the attention of the immune system that you're un you're going to undergo phagocytosis with it and you're going to get it processed because it has to be processed in order for T cells to see it. Um, <clears throat> so some molecules are too small, you know, for the immune system to see. And in that case, you wouldn't end up getting a response to them. The, <clears throat> the other thing is that... Um, we want to keep in mind that, you know, even if we're talking about an antigen, if we're talking about a protein, it's not the whole entire protein that is 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 what's recognized. So we can have mutations or changes to certain regions, and it wouldn't affect um, anginicity, whether the immune system would respond or not. So there's specific epitopes, um, and then each antigen could have multiple epitopes on it. So you could have multiple T cells and B cells responding to the same antigen the same protein but different regions of it so that when it's processed you could still activate them all. So this video just goes through and talks a little bit about the idea of epitopes, um, what they are. This is one of the topics that we'll talk about in class because um, again it's something that it, it, it's hard to talk about just with audio um, and slides. It's definitely something that's um, better kind of annotated out. So when we're looking at T cells, again, they're going to have to have a MHC presentation in order to see their antigen. Um, and so this is where APCs play a critical role in the development of the T cells, the activation of them. Um, so what we're seeing here is a T helper cell. And if you look at panel B, um, you can see the complex that's formed between the antigen presenting cell and the T cell. So on the antigen presenting cell, you can see that MHC class Two, you can see the antigen being held there. And then on the T cell side, we have a number of um, molecules that are present in this complex. So we have our T cell receptor, but then when we also have um, CD4, CD3, um, and there's other molecules too that aren't shown here, um, so that they're all important in stabilizing this complex so that the MHC with the antigen and the T cell receptor have an ability to, you know, kind of, you know, have a chance to bind and determine whether that's what the receptor is actually, whether that's what the T cell actually recognizes. Okay. 
So if the T cell receptor becomes um, activated, we can get release of interleukins, and then we can also have it so that it helps other immune cells such as a B cell. So looking at our um, B cell, um, now with the if you look in that box area, looking at that receptor complex, we have our T cell. So we have our um, T cell receptor. We have CD3, CD4 all present. Um, and then we also have the B cell, which has the MHC class 2. And so when that T cell sees that, that actually feeds back to the B cell that, oh, okay, this is a good antigen. We should go respond to it. Um, so that B cell will become activated. And then... Um, some of those cells will become memory, some of them can become plasma, and we actually also have regulatory B cells um, so that they will produce cytokines that actually help to regulate the response further, like IL-10. The memory are kept so that we don't have to go through this process again, um, you know, all the way back to hematopoietic stem cell. We already have a B cell that has a good receptor, has um, a receptor that's going to recognize the antigen, um, and so again, we don't have to want to go through that process again. So we keep some of those memory cells around, and then the plasma cells are going to produce antibodies um, that could recognize that foreign material. Looking at the antibodies that B cells produce, they can have several different functions. So when um, antibodies bind antigen, they're going to form this antigen antibody complex. One of the things it can do, if you look at the far right, can it can play a role in complement. So we already talked about the classical pathway, where with antibodies we end up getting um, the C1 complex binding to it, and then we, we get the cascading that happens. So we get activation of C4, C2, C3, C5, and we get the membrane attack complex, which would lead to the cell lysing. During complement activation, we have those other subunits that go off and cause inflammation, and they can also lead to phagocytosis too. Okay. It's not just complement that antibodies play a role in. Um, antibodies can also be neutralizing, so they can actually um, bind to um, portions of a bacteria or the exotoxins that are produced or the viruses, um, and so that those pieces of the microbe can't work. Okay. Um, and again, this is where some of the, the drugs that are being looked at is what antibodies can we produce that will block receptors that are on virus and neutralize them. Um, because you're labeling, because you're marking um, this material with the antibodies, this can lead to phagocytosis, um, enhanced phagocytosis also. Um, antibodies can also lead to uh, a process called agglutination. So this is a clump. Agglutination means clumping. So we see this with red blood cells. Um, if there's like a mis mismatch or if we're trying to uh, determine blood type, we get agglutination, clumping of the red um, blood cells. So obviously if this happens in your blood, this is not a good thing because now these red blood cells can't transport oxygen because it's going to lead to the phagocytosis of them. Okay. For blood typing, it allows us to determine what markers are present on the surface. So we would be able to tell you whether you have A markers or B markers or no markers, um, being that you're O. Okay. Um, we can also get antibodies where when they bind to the antigen, um, they actually pull the antigen out of solution. So if the antigen was soluble, um, you know, if it was dissolved in a, a solution or in blood, um, we can precipitate it out with antibodies. And so, you know, we can do that in the lab, but in a patient, the reason, the benefit of this happening is that it would allow for better clearing phagocytosis of that antigen, the removal of the antigen. Okay, so your body can produce antibodies that can cause it to bind to these soluble antigens so the immune system can clear it out better. And again, that would be precipitation. So the one um, function that we didn't talk about in that slide is opsonization. So opsonization is where we get labeling. Um, we get the antibodies across the surface of like a microbe, um, and that causes phagocytosis. So this process is also called opsonization.
And so there's several classes of antibodies. Um, they all look slightly different. They have different number of binding sites. Um, how many um, immunoglobulins are complexing together. Um, so we have IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgG. E. And they all have different roles, um, functions. So IgEs are known for um, allergy and also in worm infections. So if you elevated amounts of those, um, it could indicate that you have some kind of allergy so we could find out what it's binding to. Okay, It has the traditional Y shape where you have um, a heavy chain and two light chains. Okay, Same with IgG and IgD. They both have that same two heavy chains and two light chains. Okay. Um, with IgA, this is a dimer. Um, so each one of the monomers has two binding sites. So you actually have four binding sites. With IgMs, um, it's a pentamer. So there's actually five of these um, complexing together. So each has two. So you have 10 um, binding sites. Now, though you have more binding sites, it actually t tends to be have weaker affinity, weaker binding to the antigen. Um, one of the reasons it has to have so many binding sites. So IgMs are usually what's found um, on the first response um, early on. And then what happens is that you will undergo class switching. And so you'll end up producing IgGs. So IgGs have a higher affinity. Um, we can also get activation of complement, um, neutralization. Um, so it has a lot of implications um, to those functions of antibodies. Not that these other ones don't, but they're also found at higher percentage in circulation in the serum also. Um, they can cross the placenta. And so again, they're, high, you know, again, each class of antibody has their own function and is really important. We wouldn't want a deficiency in them. But IgGs are really critical in um, clearing up pathogens in long-term immunity. So looking at um, our antibody response, um, antibo uh, looking at an immune response with the adaptive and utilizing antibodies as a marker of that, um, we can look at, um, again, the antibody production as a uh, marker of what's going on with the B cell, right? Because if we have increased antibody production, it means that the B cell has been activated, okay? As I mentioned, it's easier to look at antibody response because we can just take like a blood draw for that. In order to really look at the T cell response, we would have to like, you know, look at lymph nodes um, and that's a little bit more invasive. Um, so we obviously, that would not be ideal for like a clinical trial or something. Okay, or, you know, trying a diagnostic test. So I'm, I'm looking at this chart, what we see is that, you know, when we're first exposed to an antigen, there's going to be this latent period. This is the time in which the innate response is trying to deal with that potential infection. Um, and so eventually what happens is we start to see an antibody response. You'll notice the first um, antibody is the IgM, right? So why I mentioned it in the last slide. So IgM is going to be the first responding, but again, keep in mind that it doesn't have a strong affinity to the antigen, so it can bind the antigen, but again, not very tightly. It's like, oh, yep, oh, but lost its grip kind of thing. Um, so ideally what you want is those B cells to become plasma cells, and so that's what you're seeing in the one to the two, um, so that we end up with the plasma cells, end up getting the IgG. So over time, what you're seeing in that first um, kind of bubble is that, again, we first have IgMs, but then we switch over to have IgGs. Now, hopefully that's clear to your infection, um, but maybe you're exposed to this antigen again, so you get a second response. In that second response, because you have memory cells, that IgG response is gonna be much stronger, much quicker. So there's not that latent period. So it's not like the immune system's waiting around and saying, okay, innate, try to do your job. Innate's working at the same time, but because we have the memory population, we are gonna have B cells and T cells that are gonna be able to respond much quicker, okay? And so, and we've already undergone that class switching, so it's gonna, those memory cells will be producing IgGs.
we end up recruiting in additional B cells. So that's why we see that little blip of IgMs um, because these are new, not new B cells, but additional B cells um, that have been recruited in because, you know, there's going to be help from the other immune cells. And it's like, okay, well, we saw this this pathogen, this antigen before, you know, let's get additional B cells. So we get what's called antigen spreading. So additional epitopes would actually be identified. And, and so again, that recruitment of additional B cells. Eventually they will undergo class switching. So those new B, the new newly recruited B cells that are producing IgMs will start to produce IgGs. So you can see how um, we get that IgG response so that we're able to end up getting clearing. Um, sometimes that clearing is before symptoms even show. Um, and again, this is the idea, <clears throat> this can naturally occur where you get repeat exposures, but the, this is the idea of vaccinations. Um, so that by being vaccinated, that's your first exposure. Maybe you need a booster, there's a second exposure. So that if you become exposed, you know, naturally, just in your daily interactions, that you would have that protection, you would have those memory cells that would be able to produce IgGs. And again, all along, the, this focuses on the B cell response, but at the same time, we also have a T cell response that has memory that would be able to respond to it. Okay, so um, just looking a little bit more at these immunities. Um, so I already I already talked about these um, at the beginning of this audio lecture. <clears throat> so keep in mind that with adaptive immunity, acquired immunity, we can look at natural immunity versus artificial immunity. And then within e each one, natural and artificial, we have active or passive. Active is where your own, the patient's immune system is doing the work. They're making the T cells and B cells. Um, passive immunity, somebody else is making the immunity, is making the T cells and B cells, um, the antibodies, and then those are transferred in. For natural immunity, again, active is where you become sick with the pathogen. Um, you have an, because you're exposed to it, you have an infection with it. Um, just keep in mind that this doesn't necessarily mean that you're showing signs and symptoms because we could be carriers, um, but it's still we can still get T cell, B cell response against it. And then with natural passive, examples of this would be if antibodies pass through um, the placenta to the fetus, mom's um, immune system made the antibodies, but then they passed to the fetus um, during gestation. And then after um, childbirth, um, during if a mother is breastfeeding, she's going to be secreting the antibodies that she's producing to the baby, and that's why it's always recommended that um, that mothers would breastfeed if they can, even if they're sick. Um, so, with an exception that if you do have a you know active infection in um, the mammary glands, um, that you it would be counterproductive to actually. Um, breastfeed and also be extremely painful. Um, also, like if you're on certain antibiotics and such, you shouldn't breastfeed. But again, um, for the most part, as long as the mother is um, feeling well enough to um, breastfeed, she should because she's passing antibodies onto the baby so that the baby would be protected. Because at that point, um, with like a newborn child, their immune system isn't fully developed, so they're going to be more susceptible to an infection. Okay. With artificial active, again, an example of this would be with immunizations or vaccines where, um, you, you know, heat treated or um, inactivated microbes would be given through the immunization um, and then your immune system um, develops a response to it. With passive, artificial passive, someone else's immune system is going to work. So again, examples would be like a blood transfusion, convalescent plasma after someone has recovered from an illness, um, or also just uh, injection of immunoglobulins um, that would ho hopefully help um, protect you against um, potential infection. So this is a checklist um, from your textbook that looks at what's needed for an effective vaccine. And I would add a perfect vaccine should meet all of these requirements. Um, so we do want to make sure that with a vaccine that we have low levels of adverse side effects or toxicity. So we don't want to do more harm with the vaccine than what the disease would do. 
um, naturally. We want to make sure that the vaccine protects against the natural wild forms of the pathogen that are out there, right? So we're usually not immunizing you with the actual pathogen. Um, so it has been altered in some way so that it won't cause disease. Um, again, ideally, um, but we still want to make sure that's going to protect you what you're going to be exposed to. When we look at the response, we should generate an antibody and T cell response. Um, you really need both in order to get a lasting um, effect and a good response. Generally with clinical trials, um, they're looking at antibody response because that's easier um, to get than with the T cell response. Um, so um, I would say that's one of the shortcomings of some of the um, vaccines and clinical studies is is looking at what the T-cell response is. But again, we just, um, our technology is getting there to be able to um, isolate those individual T-cells. Um, so I was just looking at a, you know, I have a journal club paper I was doing with immunology students where they were actually able to look at the single, like single cells um, that are in blood samples of newborn children. Um, so using just 100 microliters, which is like a drop of blood, and they were able to look at T cell, individual T cells and what surface markers they had and individual B cells and what surface markers they are. Um, but obviously that technology is not um, to the point where it's mainstream. Um, so again, we're moving in that direction so we can get better indication of T cell response with um, different vaccines. And again, during the clinical um, trial stage. With the vaccine, if we're, you know, with having a good B and T cell response, we want to have long-term lasting immunity. We want memory. So again, um, ideally we should be looking for indications of memory populations, and that's a little bit harder to do um, than antibody response. So um, the idea is that you could have lifelong protection um, against the disease. We know that's not always the case because boosters are needed. So we have found with some vaccines like pertussis, whooping cough vaccine, also with measles, that boosters are needed. Um, so, you know, if, if some of these childhood vaccines, um, usually around the age 20 or so, we need to have a booster for them um, because they're not giving that lifelong immunity. They're giving long-term immunity. 20 years is pretty good. But again, it's not giving you necessarily lifelong. And so you, if you don't do those boosters, um, you see a break in protection and immunity and then individuals can become sick. And that's one of the reasons why one of the factors that have contributed to um, increased cases of whooping cough and um, measles. The, the other issue would be that some people are opting not to vaccinate. Um, but that's a, that's a different piece. Um, with a ideal um, vaccine, we want to minimize the number of doses or boosters because we know with each additional dose, there's lower compliancy. So you lose individuals. So if you have a vaccine that requires three doses, like um, the Hep B vaccine, um, you might get a lot of people for the first one. You get less for the second and even less for the third. So then you have individuals that don't have full protection um, against it. And we also want to make sure it's affordable, so inexpensive, and with that, um, longer shelf life. Because the longer the shelf life, the cheaper the vaccine becomes. Um, because if you think about a vial of the vaccine, if there's, you know, 20 doses in it, and it's only good for an hour after you use it, <laughs> what's the chance of a doctor's office or someone having 20 patients coming in back to back um, that could use it? So then you have to throw it out, but you've only recovered the cost for that one or two doses. So the chickenpox vaccine, when it first was available, was, um, was mixed um, right before you immunize someone with during, um, during, this was back in, would have been in like 2000 when the vaccine first came out. And so within like three hours of it being mixed, it had to be administered. Um, nowadays, <laughs> it, it's much more stable. Um, so you don't have to, it's not um, completely the same 
formula, if you will. Um, so it has a longer shelf life. And so again, it makes it more likely that the, um, the healthcare providers would be using the whole um, vial of it. So there's several different designs for vaccines. Um, so with one of the designs, you can take the microbe, the virus, and you can um, kill it. Um, you can heat it or expose it to different chemicals. So it will activate it so that those, um, those dead cells still have the antigen present so that that can be used for a vaccine. Now, the benefit of this is that there's m many antigens that are present so that the person who's immunized, their immune system is more or less deciding like what it ends up responding to. Um, and it can respond to multiple antigens. Um, so it actually gives you a wider range of protection. We can also have um, where we have live or attenuated um, microbes or viruses. So this is where this, the microbe has been treated in some way to remove some of that anginicity, some of that pathogenicity. Okay, so um, it's not the same as what would, would cause the illness. Um, so again, that it's been treated in some way, but because it's live, it's able to kind of multiply. So your immune system actually has to kind of go through this fighting it off so it doesn't cause disease. Okay, again, they've been treated in some way, so it's not going to cause a disease like the natural wild form would. So those are um, how your traditional whole cell vaccines are used. So again, it's the whole microbe, the whole virus that you're immunized with. So again, your immune system has all of these different antigens um, to pick from to respond to. Now, the, um, the newer technology is using subunit vaccines. Um, and so this is where certain receptors or certain portions of the bacteria or the virus are selected for. They're synthesized in the lab and then you're immunized with those. Um, so it's not the whole path, whole microbe um, that you actually are exposed to. It's just those subunits that seem to be very key to the immune response. Again, surface um, molecules are, make good targets um, because that's what your immune system normally would respond to. So by giving you the subunit virus with surface molecules, um, you would respond to that. Now the issue with that is you don't have the whole entire microbe that's present. So you might miss some of those really um, key or important um, antigens because there's someone deciding what you're actually going to be given. Okay, so in general, whole cell vaccines um, have a tendency to give um, long-term immunity. Um, with subunit vaccines, it's going to be more likely that you're going to need a booster at some point. Um, again, the immune response that sometimes is generated by the subunits isn't as isn't as good, if you will, from the whole cell. The reason why the movement towards subunit though was that with whole cell there are some complications because you are generating kind of immune response to an infection. Um, so some of uh, issues with toxicity and side effects um, start to become a concern. So subunit vaccines are safer in the sense that you have less um, side effects and less toxicity, but again, the long-term immunity piece may not be as developed as well. Another um, newer technique um, that is being looked at is with DNA vaccines. So this is where the foreign DNA is going to be inserted into the host. Um, so we would have this plasmid that would contain part of the DNA from the pathogen. And that plasma is then plasmid is then injected into the patient. And so that plasma can get incorporated into the host cell um, and then make copies. So that your own cells end up making copies of um, from that DNA that was inserted from the pathogen. Now, it does not make your cells into microbes. Um, it, it just makes your cells into producers of that protein. And it isn't able to self-replicate. So once your immune system has cleared out those cells that have the plasma that are expressing that um, foreign material, you have that protection from the immune response and that DNA is gone. Okay, um, 
so the, the benefit of this is is much cheaper um, because you don't have the cost of producing the actual proteins and then purifying them. Um, so it's just inserting, making the plasma. Um, so this initial piece that you would have to do anyways with a subunit vaccine. Um, but now we're letting the patient, the host, um, the, the person who is immunized, their body do the work of actually producing it. Um, you know, DNA viruses, um, vaccines, DNA vaccines um, have been approved for use in other countries. Um, the U.S. has lagged a little bit. And some of the um, proposed COVID vaccines use a DNA vaccine approach. Um, so one of the things we can look at in class is look at some of the different um, vaccine strategies. And there are some additional vaccine strategies that aren't even mentioned here um, that are being looked at um, as approaches for a potential COVID-19 vaccine. All right. And as always, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me, um, but we'll be discussing some of these topics in class.